Okay. Yep. Good afternoon. Everyone had a good lunch. Um, so let's get started and don't fall asleep. Yeah. Wakey, wakey. Right. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Lucas. I work at Weka. I head up the EMEA systems engineering team. And uh, I'll just quickly introduce Axel. Yeah, Axel Rosenberg, based in Frankfurt, our mine in Germany. I'm doing pre-sales engineering for the Dach region. And we are very happy to present you today. And so why do we think this is important? So everyone wants to get better, faster, more flexible, more maximum performance, etc. And we would like to tell you how we do this. And I may repeat this a couple of times, how we do this in software, which gives you the most flexibility to keep up with future generations of processors, yeah, that you don't lock down to a technology which you purchase today, but also to make it better from your application perspective. So we don't know how you deployed your applications today, and if a customer makes a decision to utilize the Weka file system, also we come into an environment which is already there. And then we have a couple of options to make this more efficient. That's what we want to talk about it. And um, yeah, the details, you see it here, we have client QoS features in different um, areas. Um, get the most maximum value of the hardware which you spend, and we heard it this morning. Um, so networks, yeah, you can do it in hardware, you have to pay the cables and all that on. And this is also comes to an influence um, how to um, manage the storage. And then last but not least, linearity of scaling and managing the data. So, and I think if we get these three takeaways about energy, performance, and intelligence um, to manage this all, I think then we did our job for today. So, what is it about energy? So, um, yeah, so um, you have 48 core um, processors, you have 64 core processors, you have different variants. Um, either Intel or AMD, and everyone has its key advantages. We give you the freedom to choose what fits the best for you, and then configure it as for the best application use cases. Here again, this is something which you own, which you manage your applications, but we give you the freedom and the flexibility just by mount options, a simple mount option. So it's not about an installation of a code, it's about the mount options, how you can get the most benefit for your applications. And last but not least, the linearity, scality, um, scalability of the data up into data lakes. I think not everyone is, as of today, very familiar with the Weka architecture. That's why I want to spend um, some time about this. So here is where Weka is running. We need a minimum of six nodes. We are almost hardware agnostic, so we need an x86 platform, and you need NVMe SSDs. We stripe them across with distributed erasure coding. You need a minimum of six nodes that we can do a 4 plus 2 erasure coding. But you have not to scale in increments of six. You can add another node, a single node, etc., up to hundreds of nodes. So that's quite simple. And then this is what you are running in your environment. We are a multi-protocol parallel file system, so either NFS 3 or 4, SMB if you have Windows clients, SMB also with RDMA support. Then of course our POSIX client, which is a user space um, implementation. We go into the details in the next slide. We have a CSI plugin for your Kubernetes environment, and the CSI plugin gives you the same performance characteristics as you can achieve it with the POSIX client. And of course, GPU direct support is also what is available from Weka. So you may think, as you can scale up to 14 exabytes, that could be a huge expensive experiment to place 14 exabytes on an NVMe tier. So what we do, we enable you to run a single global namespace by adding almost any S3 compatible object storage. And this is a synchronous steering. Um, it's not tiering as you know it from the old days where you have to write your own scripts. When do I move my data from A to B and B to C? This is defined 
by rules which you define, say that data has not been accessed since two weeks, or that data has not been changed, the other way around, it has not been changed, and then another two weeks it has not been accessed, so that data does not seem very hot anymore, we move that data into an S3 data lake, which could be on-prem or which could be in a public cloud. You will hear cloud a couple of more times during this talk. <laughs> but the nice thing with Weka is, we keep the metadata of what is moved into here in the NVMe tier. So this is fully transparent from your application perspective. Can I just say something as well? I think what's really important about this piece as well is this S3 data lake can be an on-premise data lake, right? So this can be a generic S3 target. We have listed certified object stores on our docs page, which we're going to cover off a little bit later. This also can be to the cloud, right? So we have clusters deployed now in the field that are running a virtualized front end using Weka's POSIX client, seeing data that is locally being tiered, if you want to use that term, or being virtualized down to an S3 on-premise object store. And at the same time, we have another file system on the same cluster that is actually tiering and moving data up using our snapshot technology to the cloud. So it gives you a real on-ramp if you want to move your data workloads on and off the cloud. Yeah, which gives you all the flexibility to look for the best economics in your environment. So now we come a little bit more into the details. So what is Weka about? It's a user space container concept. And we have backend nodes and we have front end containers which are running on your application servers. And I think Volker was it this morning who said um, RDMA is causing you a lot of trouble even um, combined with Ethernet when you run into Rocky, you have all these congestions, etc. That's one of the reasons why Weka designs the product not using RDMA. We are using DPDK. Is anyone in that room who does not know what DPDK is? Please don't be shy. Okay, everyone is familiar with DPDK, and then I can assume also everyone is familiar with SPDK, which is an Intel open source library, which we use. Let me start here in the, in the very, um, let's say, basics. What you see here is the storage server, and we have running here, for simplicity, three containers. One is managing the drives, and it's using SPDK to bypass the kernel, and we manage all what is going on on the NVMe drives, what is not written here, because you have not to consider it, that's an NVMe over Fabrics implementation via the user space container. The most important container, of course, is the compute container, where we run our erasure coding algorithms, where we run the metadata management, where we run the tiering concept. So this is where you want to assign the most cores of your environment after you decided to acquire the hardware. And then, we have a front-end container, you know it from legacy parallel file systems. We have also multi-protocol support where you need additional protocol nodes. There's no free lunch, right? So we also need CPU resources to give you that access to these multi-protocols, but you can assign it very flexible. Let's say you have a 24-node cluster and 80% of your workload is POSIX, right? But you have some legacy applications or environments where you still want to use NFS, where you don't want to use POSIX. Not all the 24 nodes have to run the NFS services. So we have a minimum on requirements, which is three nodes where you have to assign then a front-end resources. It could be four, it could be three for NFS, another pair of three for SMB, or some the same for S3. So you have that flexibility for the front-end containers to assign your CPU resources as you need it. And of course, if you don't have any of these protocols, you want to run straight InfiniBand connected, doing only NVIDIA DGX A100 farms, you don't need any front-end resources at all because we support GPU Direct. Does everyone know what GPU Direct is? Hands up if you don't. This is an intelligent bunch of people. Everyone yeah, knows yeah. everything, right? So, so yeah, we will cover off some drowns, things around GPU Direct a little bit later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's an intelligence audience, yeah, because so, we are talking to HPC, right? Okay, now let's move over to the client. How does it work with the clients? There's always discussion. So, how do you manage that POSIX and metadata? And this has an influence in of us. And how do you manage kernel drivers and updates, etc.? Okay, 
The client container is also a user space implementation and in 90% of our customers running a stateless client. What does that mean? If the client wants to mount a Wecker file system, mount dash D, Wecker FS, blah, 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 blah. Yeah? Then that container is started and it runs only the time you are having that mount online. If you, you mount the file system, the container is shut down. There are environments where customers don't want this because if you use SLAM or any other scheduler and it should be there ad hoc all the time running, you can also start the client in a stateful uh, way. So the client itself, it is also talking to the NIC via DPDK. That's why I said we are 90% hardware agnostic, maybe 89, maybe 93, because not every network card is supporting DPDK with virtual functions which does not mean that you can't use that card at all, but then you would run it in UDP mode. But if we are talking about high-performance computing, if you want to run it in an environment with machine learning applications, you want to have the lowest latency and the highest throughput, then you want to go via DPDK. Of course, the application has some modules which talk to the kernel with the um, VFS is running in the kernel. So how can Weka talk to the VFS layer in the kernel? We have two lightweight libraries. Mark will explain it in the next or in the okay. over next slide, what we are doing there and what the purpose is of these libraries. But here has to be some communication. How do we manage to have that compliant and compiled to your kernel? In the moment, you do the mount, you start that container, and in the meantime, you may have done a kernel upgrade we do the compilation on the fly, fully transparent to you when you do that mount. And we support the binary in a very wide range. Let's say you are running on Rocky 8.6 today. All the updates are covered until you're going into 8.7 and only there is that compilation required. And it's getting the source from the backend servers and you have the freedom to upgrade the backends first and we support um, up to two versions up front on the client or the other way around. That's really important. A lot of our customers like that flexibility of testing things out in the field and they test it in test and dev. They will then move that into production. They're still following a set, really stringent change control process. And with this type of uh, technology, it allows them to do a much more controlled and structured upgrade over a period of time. Any questions on this concept? Because we think this is quite fundamental to understand the following options of freedom which you have when you design your application environment. Okay. You are clever people, let's move I know, on. Yeah? This is the best okay, one. Mark, now comes your show. Yeah, absolutely. So I love talking about clients and customers and I speak to them every day. And lots of people ask me around what is the best practice for Weka, right? We're going to cover off in later on in the slide deck around Weka Docs, a place where you can, online, it's the, the sort of holy gospel place to go and actually look at information. One of the other options, and it's with the minus O, is when you go to a client, you have a few, a few variables you can change, and it depends on the application that you're using. Not every application is created equally. Some are read intensive, some are write intensive, some use millions and millions of 4, 8K, 16K blocks. Some will have huge singular <laughs> files, two petabytes, three petabyte files, all in gas, life sciences, use a lot of large, large files. So what we have is the ability on a mount, if you just type Weka mount, it just uses one core, and it will go off and you can connect on that client to the cluster. Job done. No complexity, simple as needed. Certain customers, and I was chatting to a very large uh, customer that was running an HPC environment with lots of databases, they wanted a lot more read-intensive uh, read uh, type performance. And so they had the option here, as you can see there, of allocating cores around the client that was doing the read-intensive applications. The other thing that we specify, which is really nice, is I remember spending a lot of time in HPC land looking at numa regions. Yeah, is the card, is the memory in the right numa region? I'm sure we've all done that. We've optimized that client for that, right? With us, we can specify the network card. It says it there, I think it is, and even the slot number, and that's really, really important. So we can actually tailor make the client optimal for that particular application workload. 
The other key thing about it are these two modules here, WeckerFS GW and WeckerFS IO. We have a huge amount of information up on our website about how these modules work and how they can scale independently on a cluster. Um, this is quite important also, I forgot to mention, as you see here, we support Ethernet and InfiniBand at the same time in the same cluster, so it has not to be either Ethernet or InfiniBand. When we do InfiniBand, we also do IP over IB. Yep. So we support RDMA in InfiniBand, of course, as we support GDS. Yep. We detect when you send your data to the Wacker system in Reese, I think, until 32K package size. We do still DPDK, even in InfiniBand, because it's more efficient. If it's beyond 32 kilobytes, we use RDMA, and for writes, I think it's 256 56, yeah. kilobytes when we start using RDMA. Yeah. So you can use IB or Ethernet at the same time in the same cluster. Yeah, we do have a lot of customers doing that, so they will actually do a lot of their scratch space using good old school InfiniBand, what I love, but they will also use and have access for generic clients, just running on 100 gigabit Ethernet, 200 gigabit Ethernet, 25 gigabit Ethernet, right? That data can be seen single source of truth from both the Ethernet network and the InfiniBand network. So, a couple of more information about um, client options when you do the stateless client using. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so I can look around this side, hopefully you can still hear me and see me. So yeah, absolutely. So we talk about num cores, right? So one of the key things that we talk about there is the number of cores that the front end's gonna drive. How many do we really need? And we talked about this a little bit earlier on. The other area, that using the minus O, the option, the mount option there is DPDK, NIC, or UDP. I have a customer that was running some really, really old CentOS clients, and they didn't support DPDK, so we ran them in UDP mode. When they refreshed that Linux version to a supported version that supported DPDK, it's painless, seamless, we just changed the mount option. Instantly, they're available and online. The other area is dedicated mode. This is really, really interesting. So we will allocate cores, as Axel was talking about, when we do a mount, right? One is default, you can specify more and more. There are certain clients that actually don't, they might have an application running that don't use any storage processing at all, and they don't want to nominate a core. They might just say, actually, I will use the core when I do a storage call, an interrupt call. So we have the ability to have a dedicated mode that allows them to say, actually, don't allocate any cores. When you start to write I.O. or read I.O., spin up a core, grab a core, grab a core allocation, and then mount that file system. The other area as well, which is really important, is for HA mounting. We have the ability to do an HA option as well, which is listed down the bottom. And all of these are listed out in our Docs Weka page. At one point, oh. about the dedicated mode, the standard of us is our um, driver is running in polling mode. This That's means, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's ready all the time, ready, waiting, if there's any demand from your application, which is the fastest thing ever. I was talking to a customer who said, okay, this is not the best efficiency from an energy perspective if you spin up the core all the time. That's what we say if you say dedicate equals none, we run it in interrupt mode. So we have also the flexibility there and you can do it different aspect lines. So it's not a global setting, it's an individual setting for the client, which is then also again important. You are using schedulers, you are using job schedulers to make sure that yes, you have sir. the right course or if you have all the freedom if you run in non-dedicated mode. I think, I think on that as well is, um, you know, these are options that you can choose. I think that's the most important thing around this. And the polling mode, if you run the HTOP, you can see the UP, your CPU utilization being grabbed. It's running at 100% as it's grabbing that, as, as Axel was saying. If you actually run it in the other mode, the, the HTOP or the, the, the processing core uh, is listed down. It's actually down at zero when you run that. Okay. That is it um, summarizing. And now moving to the next theme. You raised it already a little bit, it's Zuma <laughs> management, right? And um, the concept, that was all about the client. We come back to the client, but we also need and want to explain you how we run it in the back end on the storage servers. Yeah? Yep. So, so this is a picture. So one of the questions is we, I have with customers, they ask me when I was back in the day, you know, if, how many CPU cores do I need to allocate to my Weka cluster, right? And we, uh, Back in when there was 24 core CPUs, we would support, 
you know, 19 cores and the rest was done for the application. And you could tune up and down and we were stopped at 19 cores. What we've done recently, and I love this, is as the CPU manufacturers have produced more and more and more cores, we wanted to leverage that. So we're really excited. As soon as Intel or AMD release a new socket type or a new core number of cores, we can instantly get benefits. So here is an old example where we used to allocate compute, front end and drives. And you can see here on the left hand side, the processes start naught to nine. Can you see that? And it says Weka 30 all the way down. And it stops at 19. 19 cores, 0 to 19 cores. And you can see there, if you actually have a look at the very, very top, we've got one alloc core is allocated as the management slot. We've got a couple of front end cores as compute, and then we've got the remaining cores up to the 19 as drives. And that worked really well for 24 core CPUs. Not good enough today, Weka's improved. So what we have now is a term, we call it Weka's multi-container backend. And here's an example, right? So. Here's a little LS CPU. I mean, you're looking up there and it has 47 cores. And what we want to do is leverage and decide out of those 47 cores, what are we going to allocate for the front end? What are we going to allocate for compute? And what are we going to allocate from drives, NVMe drives? So we have a tool that allows us to do this. And you can see it listed here up to 160, where this is on the same compute zero. And what we've actually done there is, if you actually have a look there, up to 100. 26 is it? 126 is drives and we have multiple computes so we're no longer strapped to that 19 CPU core limit. So it's really exciting for me because the more cores we have the faster Weka will run as long as you have got networking and obviously NVMe. For the current generation I don't think so. CPUs are available with less than 32 cores. Nope. That would be a waste of environment. So we can keep up just development on the software end to keep pace with the hardware evolution. Yeah. yeah. So numer allocations, dual socket, four socket, six socket, we've all been there looking at different how we allocate the, the NVMe drives in the same region. I'm not going to spend too much time on this as well, but we can have the ability to pin cores. So lots of our customers that run AMD will have certain workloads that they want to pin CPU cores, particular uh, drives, or if it's the front end, and it has to be in the same NUMA region. This is around efficiencies. We have some great best practices around that, which is good. The other key thing... Yeah, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the other key thing I was going to say there, as you can see there, it says NUMA 0, front end, compute and drive. NUMA 1, compute, drive and drive. So we can even allocate different NUMA regions for that. Yep, thanks. This is all not secret source, so everything in Weka is available on docs.weka.io. So you have not to have a library with nine books or whatever to manage your Lustre cluster. Um, so you can read it up there, everything is available and nothing is secret. Um, I think one last slide here about the NUMA is just here, so we have options and recommendations how to do your BIOS settings, etc. So do switch that off from the beginning and then use the magic which Becca enables you by software changes. Which brings me now to the next most exciting thing is about <laughs> scalability. Yeah, so, um, what is it about chat GPT, what we learned this morning? It's about massive amount of data and you want to have your algorithms running on this data and how to manage it. Again, at the minimum euros, dollars, pounds, lira, whatever um, you want to spend on the storage. So what, what we are doing here, I mentioned it, so we can connect the NVMe file system to any S3 compatible object storage. How would you do is so simple commands, so you just go in and attach that tier globally to that cluster, that S3 environment. But this does not mean everything is now connected. You decide it on the file system level. Not every file system needs it. So you attach a bucket to a file system and then you have that tiering option. So, and this is all fully transparent to your application and you even do not notice this. So your, your students or your researchers or whoever, they see a mount in your um, um, operating system and it shows you five terabyte available, but actually it's only 400 gigabytes or 400 terabytes of NVMe and the rest is tiered down to the object level. 
I, did I mention it, how we do that tiering? Actually, we do it not on a file basis, but we collect it up to 64 megabyte packages. If yep. we have small of 1K, 10K, whatever files, we put them together in an object. We keep the metadata available. If you want to read a single file from one of these packages, you have not to dehydrate that entire 64 package. We just dehydrate that single piece of information to make that 10K file again available. If you are dealing with 10 gigabyte, 50 gigabyte video files, we split them in multiple pieces and um, spray them around across multiple 64 megabyte blobs inside the object source that we all the time can keep all processors and threads available in the cluster. Yeah. So if you add more storage backend nodes, you also add more network ports talking to your S3 storage and you scale in all dimensions at the same time. Yeah, I think I will add as well, we do have a, a feature which uh, we've had to use in the past, not so much recently, where people said, my object store is really fast. How do you measure fast, right? So I'm a big measurement person. And we've had to enable an option called throttle, which basically slows down the writing from Weka to that back-end S3 object store. So there's some best practice around that. We have the ability to do that, as Axel was saying earlier on. Just to show here, so that's how your application is seeing it. That is what is allocated. If you remember from the slide before, what you see here, we have only 400 gigabyte available. This means your application is actually already using that entire namespace. Two more slides to sum it up, what we talked until now. And then we have a very important topic, which I was a little bit shy if that is the right topic for an HVC conference, but what I learned this morning from Thorsten, it's very important for you guys. And so, two more slides for you, Mark, to... Yeah, I will be quick, because we're running out of time, right? So, uh, yeah, so, absolutely. So, here is some great ones here. We, when you mount a client, we have a couple of options, a recache option, a write cache, and force direct I.O., which means don't use any local caching on the client as well. Some certain databases, some applications don't like caching, they just want to pass it straight through to the NIC. We've all been there, we've done it. We have those options there. We've mentioned before already the dedicated mode, full or none, and again that was interrupt driven as Axel corrected me, thank you for that earlier on. And then the last one is client quality of service, right? I remember the days people say, oh you don't support quality of service on your cluster. Hell no, we want to go fast as possible. Right? Quality of service, I believe, should be at the network level or at the client level, so we now have a feature that I nagged engineering about, which is to allow you to limit the, the amount of available throughput from a client to the Weka cluster. Yeah, I think that's it for all what you're running on-prem. But the beauty of Weka is it's one code, it's one license you can run on-prem or in the public cloud. And, yeah, that is why I was hesitant, because the cloud, everyone says the cloud is expensive, right? So, yeah, it is expensive, but if you do it in the right way, it's not expensive, and it has kept up with the network performance, as we again learned this morning by Torsten. Is, it, can I ask, is anyone in the room not got a cloud account of some sort? Has everybody got some sort of cloud account in the room, or has used cloud? Yeah? It's an interesting one. I asked that question... I was thinking about three years ago, three or four years ago, to an audience, an HPC audience, and loads of people put their hand up. We hate the cloud, yeah? It's slow, it doesn't work, it doesn't scale, there's no linearity. Latency sucks. I remember those terms, right? These things have changed. The cloud, as we heard this morning, is getting better and better. I'm not saying it fixes everything, but for certain workloads, we would absolutely recommend the cloud at a cost point. But then again, we don't mind. You can use Weka on-premise. As well. Yeah, there are multiple use cases like um, buffering, so we have some pharmaceutical clients, they need for a project 30,000 cores, so buying 30,000 cores and having there for 12 months in the data center, but they need it only for three months, that's the perfect use case for the economics in the cloud. As said, it's one license. Um, we are proud that we are now available in the Azure marketplace, only since a couple of weeks. With AWS, for example, we are way more advanced what the integration into um, CloudFormation templates um, is about. And I want just to show you a simple example. So if you have an entitlement with Weka, you go to start.weka.io and you do your capacity specification.
on a K I ops. And then you get a couple of options how many instances you would need in AWS. You choose what is for you the best option, and then just you click on deploy, and then what happens? You can just have a review, and you could even add your compute client. It really is as so simple as that. It generates a cloud formation template in AWS. You can actually go into AWS and see it, which is really cool, and you can deploy Weka straight into an AWS environment in minutes. We give you a Weka license based on your capacity usage, and it really is as simple as that. You can rediscover that. You say, actually, I've overcooked the performance, or I've undercooked it, or I need an S3 tier. Again, you can change that Terraform, uh, sorry, that cloud formation, cloud formation template, create a new one, or reapply it to an existing AWS resource, and again, you can change the Weka cluster dynamically on the fly. So where's Hussein? I created you just the bus buffer for CSCS. So does he not see it? Okay. Hussein has other things to do. But we prepared some environment for you where you can run some bursting. I think with that, it was all what we have prepared for you. Okay, no questions. Thank you. Thank this you. means we did a good presentation. Thank Everyone you. is clear. Bum 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 b